So hello Theo, I'm very happy Hi, to meet you today. Um, so I'm gonna ask you a few questions uh, on the subject of my of my research, artistic research. Yeah. Um, so I'm not a journalist. I'm a singer talking to a singer, and um, so I'm sure it's gonna be super interesting <laughs> for me to learn all your background, all your influences, and uh, so on. So could you just introduce yourself in a few words? Uh, my name is Theo Blackman. I'm a singer, composer, performance artist, yeah, and teacher. <laughs> yeah, for the moment it's not bad to be a teacher. I've well. always been a teacher, but <laughs> for the moment I'm only a teacher, for the most part. Teacher and recording artist <laughs> That's good, at home. Good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what style of music do you consider to belong to? <clears throat> Jazz. Mm -hmm. Jazz and creative music. Um, I always think of myself as a jazz musician, partially because <laughs> I come from jazz and I think in a jazz context as far as improvisation and rhythmic articulation. And most of the musicians that I collaborate with and that I choose for my music are jazz musicians because of that, because they can improvise and they have a rhythmic feel that I can't find anywhere else. Okay. And how would you describe your musical style? Um, I would describe my musical style as music that most people don't like. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I say to people when they ask. And that's usually a good answer because it's true. That's the best answer <coughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's so honest. Wow. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, that's not true. And you know that's not true. No, most people don't. <laughs> don't. It's okay. <laughs> I have made peace with that. It's not a bad thing. It's better to, you know, if you if when you have a concert and you start singing and people leave, I'm always very grateful for those people because they're not going to stink up the atmosphere for the rest of the concert. So, I'm giving you the freedom to not like it and we can still be friends, you know. Okay. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's good if you if you don't like it, it's okay. <laughs> I don't need you to like my music or what I do or think highly of me in any way for me to feel that what I do is worthwhile or is the right thing to do for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There and we how, have it. Yeah. And how did you learn music? Um, I learned music from both from both ends, <laughs> instinctually, just by repeating uh, through by, by, by ear, basically, and then also through uh, having classical piano lessons as a child and guitar lessons um, that then later turned into classical guitar lessons, which was probably the biggest nightmare that I can remember <laughs> in music. <laughs> Learning classical guitar is unbelievably difficult, I thought. Um, but yeah, so from both a, a joyous, instinctual, uh, place sharing music in a choir and with a uh, with a group of singers and with a group of uh, guitarists and learning <clears throat> very simple folky kind of songs and then also conservatory trained. Okay, so mostly for piano and guitar, not for voice. I'd never had voice lessons, but I sang as a child uh, in a children's choir. I was a boy soprano soloist. Um, so for me, singing was always the first and most natural and most uh, the easiest thing to do. Okay. But I'm, as a child, you don't, growing up in a village, you don't think, oh, I could be a singer. That's so far f from anything that you could possibly imagine you could sustain a life with, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, that wasn't really an option. Singing was always fun. It wasn't something that you did as a profession. Mm -hmm. you know? It was just joyous and... And, and just very easy. It's too easy. <laughs> it's too easy to make a living. Because when you make a living, it has to be hard and difficult and it's a job and I don't know. But yeah, so singing was always there. And then when I had a, uh, when I had my voice break, when I, you know, at 13, I couldn't yeah. sing in the choir anymore. So I took some time off. And when my voice came back at 17, 18, I started singing and that's when I got into jazz a little bit more, 
uh, heavily because I had friends in school who were listening to jazz and introduced me to jazz. Okay. Interesting. Um, could you explain me how important is transmission for you through music and through teaching? Transmission. Yeah. Um, Ça veut dire quoi? La transmission. The, the fact to transmit. Oh, to pass on? Like to mm. pass on knowledge? Yes, that's it. Um, I think it's a very important aspect of Uh, being an artist is to learn from other artists, be around other artists. But what I'm seeing right now is that a lot of uh, young students are so f forced into a self-centered uh, aesthetic. So everything that um, is asked of them is to draw from their own vision, from their creativity, from who they are. I want to be me. I want to live my life. I want to have, I, it's my journey. All this kind of stuff that really <clears throat> fosters a very narcissistic idea of what art is about. And so for me, I'm saying this as a teacher because it's very difficult to find students <clears throat> that are not drawn to that kind of art, make, art making or music making where everything is about them. Mm. And that is also a very difficult student to teach because it really, at the end of the day, music is not about you at all, actually. <laughs> It's about something much bigger than you that you try to touch on, that you try to reach for. But it's not something that you have invented or you create or that you uh, bring you know, into the world for the first time. It's not like that at all. And a lot of students um, have a hard time receiving something that I want to pass on because they see it as criticism or as a failure. Mm -hmm. And so it's been an interesting uh, observation for me to see how the generations are changing as far as teaching and as far as passing on, as far as transmitting something. Sometimes it can't be heard. Some people don't have the receptors. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think it's an important aspect of becoming, uh, becoming part of the community, becoming a, a singer or becoming an artist or whatever you want to call it. I never use the word art very much. Um, I think it's a little bit precious, but if you want to, you know, call yourself an artist, fine. Um, but for me, being around other artists or other musicians is has brought on my own voice, has brought about okay. what I consider to be, you know, my, my voice or my musicality or whatever. Uh -huh. What represents the, the tradition for you? The tradition in jazz? Yeah. What represents it? Yeah. Uh, harmony, rhythm. <laughs> No, well, in the tradition, gen, just in general, <clears throat> is it important for you? Yes, mm -hmm. it's important, not because it's important. It's important because, because I love it. Okay. That's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of uh, students, <clears throat> particularly from Europe, who want to collude with me against tradition. Not saying that it's you, but, you know, students that come to a lesson and they, they don't like jazz standards. And they try to get me to say the same thing. And I'm like, no, I love jazz dance. I love bebop. I love all that with all my heart. There's yeah. no hesitation. So for me, I love tradition because I love it. Because mm -hmm. I think it's beautiful. Not because I should. Not because it's good for me. It's not medicine that I need to take. So if you don't like or don't have a connection to tradition that's also okay, right? There's many ways to be become whatever you want to be. It's not one way. I'm trying to make students understand why jazz standards, why bebop, why the tradition is so wonderful, mm -hmm. why it's so lovable, right? It's not something that you have to roll your eyes at and it's old and, oh, it has nothing to do with me and how can it have anything to do with today and it's this and it's that. <clears throat> I try to find the stuff that's lovable. And once you connect to that, it's, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. 
So in your teaching, there is a place for tradition and also a place for modernity? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, most of the students that I get through Manhattan School of Music, where I teach, are already very deeply steeped in tradition. But sometimes the connection is missing. They don't really understand why they should love it or they mm -hmm. don't love it or they don't really have a connection to the song. So for me, <clears throat> one of the, the things I can do as a teacher is help them find that connection, right? And, and sort of set that, set that flame on fire that they like, oh, I get it. Oh my God, yes, this has everything to do with me. This is exactly about what I'm going through. This is a beautiful melody. Oh my God, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to work so hard to make this happen. Um, this is, it, it is a beautiful garden of, of music that you can ha hang out in if you want to, you don't have mm -hmm. to. Some students don't. And every student has a different sort of approach to their, their vision <clears throat> or the vision that they don't have yet. So as, as I often say, some students come in and they know exactly what they want. I want to sing the blues. Boom, done. That's all I want to do. Some students just want to sing standards to, to the 50s or 60s, right? All the American, great American songbook. Some students don't want to sing with words. Some students want to write their own material. But there's a lot of students, a lot of young singers that don't know what they want to do. And so I think that's just as good because if you don't know what you want to do, you just keep trying and eliminate the stuff that you don't want to do until you have what you want to do, right? So if you don't, you try this, oh, I don't like it, but I like this part about it. <clears throat> you try this and you, I like Cole Porter, but the, the Frank Lesser tunes, you, know, you just carve out an aesthetic and an idea very much like a sculptor. Hmm. that chips away what they don't want and they're left with what they want or what they want to express. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the modernity for you in your singing? And do you think it's <clears throat> important to be modern? No, I don't think it's important to be anything. It's important to be true to yourself. Hmm. The reason why I call myself a jazz musician very vehemently is what I'm drawn to in jazz is the pioneer and learning history and then over over throwing it overboard kind of aesthetic mm. which i can see in contemporary music and i see in jazz music maybe in pop music a little bit but not as much as in jazz like jazz is really made for learn your craft and then come up with something different so for me that's that's why modernity or or being modern doesn't sometimes <clears throat> if you live long enough, <laughs> you see that creativity and tastes are cyclical. Yeah. Things come around in different ways. Right now, just to sort of give you my impression, we live in a extremely skill-driven jazz moment. Like everybody is incredibly good. <laughs> like skills are through the roof. Everybody can play everything really well and everybody's singing perfectly in tune and everything is just super precise and everything is very, very photoshopped, like musically, everything is very, very um, produced. But if you look back at the 70s, for example, and, and Chick Corea and Return to Forever, for example, that stuff is rough around the edges. And it's about the creative force and about the playing together as a group and mm -hmm. finding new timbres, new new ideas as a group without it being completely chopped down into little pieces. I'm not saying this judgmentally. I'm saying this, look for the <laughs> return to forever, um, sort of the cyclical nature. There was a time when uh, things became very conservative a couple of decades ago, like in the 90s. Jazz music take, to, became very, very looking back to the roots and finding you know, tradition in the music, it's, it's gotten so far into pop and into funk. And it, it was sort of like trying to find like, what is jazz as, as a, you know, as an art form at the base, and then we can build these different branches on top of the hedges. But 
Um, so there's always these different tastes and different um, streams that are happening. Mm -hmm. Same with singing. If you look at the singers in the in the 50s and the 60s, the singing was extremely powerful. There was a lot of chest voice. There was a lot of belting going on. And um, n then throughout the 70s and 80s, singing became much lighter until suddenly singers, jazz singers, were extremely wispy. And very, very... Da -ba -ba -da -ba 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 -da 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 and that is not a judge judgment call. It's We live in... Even though we think it's an art form, it's a very elevated art form, it's just as much part of tastes and fashion hmm. as everything else. Yeah, of course. You know, so people suddenly like these kinds of voices. Now, we are on another swing now. That's that's backfired. And now we're into really fully formed, multicolored voices um, and and very powerful, you know, female singing, which is great, which I'm all for. Um, so that's sort of sort of another taste. The men, the men's voices <laughs> have become very hyper male 20 years ago. Like, yeah. you know, you have to be like extra, extra loud and extra male. And the female voices became very wispy and very girly. And now that's all tumbling and being mixed up again. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Great to see it like this also. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, what are your influences, both from singers and instrumentalists? Do you want names or just... <clears throat> yes, why not? Um, names. One of the great influences early on in my life was Sheila Jordan, mm -hmm. um, who I st studied with in the beginning and then we she became a mentor and and has become one of you know my closest people here in new york and in general and that was a breakthrough because i that was exactly between tradition and and modernism like she, at the time in the in the late 80s when i met sheila she was singing you know charlie parker tunes just as much as she, she was singing original tunes but in a way that was completely out there her phrasing she would go into free improvisations it was extremely precise and it was extremely uh, skillful mm -hmm. but without it being about that okay and that is a really big difference because when i talk to sheila about some of the stuff that she's doing which is vocally very very sophisticated as far as register balances and whatever um, and musically and harmonically, what she's doing is also extremely sophisticated. It wasn't about that. It wasn't that she studied this and she checked this box and then she took a class in harmonic substitutions and how to sing over that and blah, blah, blah. And so it's an interesting, intuitive, <laughs> kind of divine uh, person. And so for me, most of my influences have been instrumental. First yeah. of all, because the, the person that really introduced me to jazz when I was 17, 16, 17, was um, my best friend in school, was a clarinet player and a jazz saxophonist. And all we listened to was Coltrane and Albert Ayer and Miles Davis and every, you know, Freddie Hubbard. And so that for a while, that was pretty much it. And then um, I was introduced to all this, the great singers. I mean... You know, lots of lots of hard to find male singers at the time, except yeah. for John Hendricks. Al Jarreau was a very big influence mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, especially. And then Bobby McFerrin came around, um, and that sort of blew everything out of the water as far as possibility with the voice. But as far as influences, I'm, I've always been influenced by people that do something that's mysteriously beautiful like hard to understand but you you love it anyway sort of like this hmm, but I can't stop listening to it and so for me contemporary music has been a big influence mm -hmm. um, Norma Winston has been a beautiful influence um, John Hendrix for a strange yeah. reason <laughs> I listened to for a long time um, and there's tradition and um, 
Ella Fitzgerald came into my life much later, and I, I'm probably one of her biggest fans. So this is a, a strange mix of tradition and avant-garde, or what, whatever you want to call yeah. it. Yeah. And you were born in Germany. Mm -hmm. Could you exp could you talk about about your roots, maybe? Yes, um, I was. Well, I was born in Germany and I was adopted at the age of one by a family in Germany and grew up there, went to school. I went to, um, as I said, I started learning piano and guitar when I was a kid, like at 10 or something. And um, then when I was a teenager, I went to a school in Lyon also for a student exchange. So I had a little bit of time away and saw another culture hey yeah. <laughs> fun and then uh, as soon as I finished high school I took this a, a workshop with Sheila Jordan in uh, Graz Austria at the okay. at the conservatory which didn't have a vocal program at the time mm -hmm. and so the <laughs> the great thing was I got on a 15-hour train ride to audition for this class I got into this class which was a class of five students Hand selected by Sheila to study with her for three months, which basically ended up being me somehow getting a key to the school, get, getting into the school first thing in the morning and practicing all day, and then having one lesson a week with Sheila and hanging out with Sheila every day. Okay. So that was the most blissful six months or however long I was there ultimately, and set me off to move to. Uh, New York in 89. <clears throat> to be more with her? or To to study jazz and be out of, you know, be away, yeah, and study with her, study, uh, be in New York, just be away from that, you know, small German scene at the time, because it was mm -hmm. still West Germany then. And so at a certain point you decided to become an American citizen? Mm -hmm. In 2005. I'd, um, I had my green card until then and then I decided to uh, take on citizenship. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Or dual citizenship. I have. I mean, I can. I can live in Europe as well. But it was especially um, pertinent because uh, <clears throat> Bush was president at the time, yeah. and we all thought, "Oh dear, you know, this could end at any given moment." Your your life that you've had for for you know twenty years almost could just be toppled over mm. by some political idiot, <laughs> which only got worse later. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> And so today you consider yourself really as an, Amer an American singer, American person? Um, sure. Yeah. Does it matter? Yeah, I guess. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I've spent more time in America than in Germany at this point yeah um, I feel fully integrated I have my family is I mean Sheila I consider Sheila my family my husband's here um, so everything seems very yeah homey <laughs> yeah and does the rhythm of society or technology influence your music and and your phrasing the rhythm of technology and the, the rhythm, rhythm of, of society so I think in New York it's very, very hectic and crazy, mm -hmm. crazy life. <clears throat> Do you think it's an influence on your music? Yeah, I think everybody's influenced some somewhere mm -hmm. th through their environment. But I don't think that I write faster music because I live in New York. Mm -hmm. I think I write slower music because I live in New York because I just don't want to hear one more fast, <laughs> hectic... So it is an influence. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> Whether you know it or not. Um, yeah, I mean, most of the music I write is sort of feels like it's in a bubble of my own imagination. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's <clears throat> that influenced by the environment because I could write... this. I would probably write a similar piece here or elsewhere. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like if I'm in a in a forest, I would write really pretty music, and if I'm here, I'm writing very angular, aggressive music. I don't think that's that's how I function. Mm -hmm. With the project with the Westerlies, mm -hmm. 
uh, you have done this album with a brass quartet, no rhythm section, no piano, no guitar. It's really a great album. Thank you. Um, could you explain how you work with them? Um, we work like a rock band, like we try stuff out. Somebody brings in a half an arrangement somebody or I bring in a full arrangement like um, look for the union label was is written as it was there's no there was no discussion about it much and some of the stuff is developed together um, it's it's messy in a good way it's it's not uh, it's not it's not like somebody writes and then it's that's it so there's a lot of discussion a lot of rehearsing a lot of trying things out with each other Um, and I think that's why the result is different from somebody sitting at a desk and writing music for <laughs> the five mm -hmm. of us or something like that. And everybody brought in their own aesthetic or their own ideas. Um, there's some original music, some adaptations. Um, and for me, I had to <clears throat> well, listen to them particularly um, and understand not only how brass music functions in general like mm -hmm. as a concept but also how they play together and that that was interesting to see because it was the evening after i'd listened to a, a quartet concert of just a westerlies set that i wrote the arrangement for look for the union label because i really under suddenly understood whose function was what and who how can i distribute voices and and, and pass them around in a way that I hadn't considered before. Very different from a string quartet. Yeah. And are you also uh, influenced by other artistic disciplines? Yes, very much so. Absolutely more so than anything. Uh, I'm influenced by the visual arts yeah. and uh, contemporary art. Because I think contemporary art has the power uh, to throw out ideas that music sometimes cannot do in a way uh, that the visual arts can because of the aspect of time mm. um, <clears throat> you can have um, ideas that can can be quite confrontational or quite uh, jarring in in a visual field where you can either look at it and or walk away but if you're doing something that takes <laughs> a two hour concert to unravel that doesn't always that doesn't always work with one idea or with one uh, sort of point of view. So I'm always interested in compositional uh, ideas that come from from the visual arts. Okay. Great. Like for example, where do we in music have the equivalent of a Jeff Koons? somebody who takes kitsch and elevates it to a point that it is not no longer kitsch, but is high art, is something that is actually transcending itself. And that's really, I am still trying to figure that out in music, that I don't think that exists. Maybe the closest we can come to is Coltrane playing My Favorite Things, mm, right? I Where you have something quite kitschy or something quite saccharine being elevated to <clears throat> a point of, wow, this is bigger than I even thought it could be. Mm -hmm. And the same is, you know, I think of Jeff Koons a lot because that, that sort of, that's one of many uh, ideas or, or artists that I think we don't really have that kind of approach in music. And... What is the role of the melody for you? Which place does the melodic part have in your singing? Well, that depends on the piece. Um, sometimes I write pieces that have no melody, which I realize is just interesting. <laughs> like Orchard, for example. Like, what is the melody in Orchard? Um, um, melody is is one of the the things that I listen to first, but it's not the thing that necessarily keeps me engaged at the end of the day. Okay. Um, like a good melody is pretty essential to what I like to sing and what I would like to write. 
I think there's nothing more honorable than writing a good melody. Mm-hmm. Like that's a hard thing to do. Like a, a melody, like a like a Richard Rogers kind of melody that has no chromatic notes, but it has an integrity that's just mind boggling and that you like to sing and that feels good with the lyric. Mm. That's a that's one of the hardest things to do, and that's what I only know a few composers that can actually pull that off really well. Mm. Contemporary composers, because that's a special craft. Yeah. So it's important to me, but there's other elements in music that sometimes are become more important. Like I said, sometimes I write a piece. I'm like, what's? There's no melody. In this. It's just a bunch of chords. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, as singers are always delegated to being the melody, right? Yeah. Delegated. Yeah. I mean, we have That's the true. honor of being <clears throat> the melody. But mm-hmm. I like to think away from that sometimes because it can bring out something more exciting than what I've already done a million times, which is sing the melody. And do you prefer to stay close to what's written or is interpretation what matters more to you? Well, that de- depends on what what piece you're playing if you're writing an original piece you have to interpret it some but like why bother writing an original if you're just doing something else anyway so <laughs> <laughs> might as well what write what you're singing or not or just don't write anything um but if you if you're doing a standard then the context is important like the context of what is going on around you is important. So if I write an arrangement of a standard where every parameter has changed, then maybe I want to be the one that's not changing. So I keep the melody extremely intact, including mm-hmm. exact rhythms. But <clears throat> if I'm playing with a jazz trio, you know, basically improvising all our parts, I want to be part of that improvisation too. So if I, you know, if the if the piano player can play chord symbols, That's an improvisation already. Like whether you play a C minor like this, or you play it like this. Or voice it, you know. So that to me is, I want to be part of that too. I want to improvise, I want to stretch out. Um, so it depends on the context. Yeah. And you were talking about the lyric. Do you prefer to transmit a message with the lyrics or do you rather use your voice as an instrument to convey emotions without words? <clears throat> well, I no, I my voice is not an instrument. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Never. My voice is my voice. I refuse that expression because it again it delegates the voice into being something else. Like you are now an instrument. No, I'm not an instrument. I'm a voice. You know, you could say my voice is my instrument that, you know, that's just uh, linguistics. But I refuse to think of my voice as an instrument because that means it's less less than I am normally am. Like if I sing, ah, that doesn't mean I'm an instrument. I'm still my voice, mm-hmm. right? With the same person behind it, with the same emotion. I think when people think voice as an instrument, they think less emotionality, less connectivity to what they're doing. They're just executing pit- pitches on a certain vowel. And that's to me, that's the death of music, of, of, of jazz singing. <clears throat> when singers think of themselves as an instrument in that way. <laughs> like, think of yourself as a person singing. Well, you don't have words, but you have syllables. You have the sound of your voice. You can change that. That could, you know, that that's up for discussion or improvisation. But don't think of yourself as an instrument executing somebody else's job. Like, don't think of yourself as I'm doing the job that an instrument would normally do, but I'm a voice. Mm. To me, that's very not satisfying philosophically and musically usually ends up being this neutral kind of singing that has that just feels second to an instrument. Mm. So for me, the lyrics are important when they're there. And sometimes emoting a lyric is the thing to do. Sometimes stepping back from a lyric is the thing to do, especially when the 
when I've written an arrangement of a piece where the, the music and the arrangement itself is already expressing something about this mood or about this piece, that if I start to emote into the lyric, it's just going to get really messy. And it sort of, it sort of takes over. It, the, the singer usually <clears throat> is the first thing that the ear goes to. And then if you start to impose your own emotionality on things, sometimes it actually lessens what you're trying to do because it just gives too much specificity to something. Mm. And sometimes it's nice to be mysterious and not have this like, this is about my pain. And then we go over here and this is about my joy. And this is about my anger. And this is about me feeling very vulnerable. So it's really a, a way to um, actually be more universal, mm. to not be as specific sometimes. And sometimes you just got to lean in and really, really r make clear of what this is about for you emotionally and then express it as hard as you can. Mm -hmm. And you mainly write yourself the lyrics you sing. Uh, well, if it's not a standard or yes, if, it's, if not, it's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if yeah. it's not something, an original that somebody has written for me, then mm -hmm. yes, yeah, I write my own lyrics. That's hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's really hard. Um, <laughs> lyric writing is is um, is a tricky is a tricky subject, and it's it takes forever sometimes. Yeah, <clears throat> it's, it's um, words. Lyrics are not poetry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> lyrics are not poetry, and poetry are, is not lyrics. So if I if I set a poem to music, and then ask the listener to understand it is really is almost insulting to the poem because if you really spend time with a poem it would take you maybe sometimes a month to understand it mm. if it's a really rich and po like you can't uh, it's very much like a book like you read a book in what a week or something so a poem takes just as much as a book sometimes to really understand each of the you know, cross references and what they mean. <clears throat> so yeah. setting poetry to music is, is daunting because you have the music that, and you have the poem that is complex in and of itself. And for me, writing a good lyric actually is not writing that complexity into a, a, a song. And what you have with music is the aspect of repetition or nonsensical writing that you can't always do in poetry. Mm. Right, ooh baby or na 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 na, <laughs> would not work. <laughs> but it works in songs. Ooh baby, hit me one more time. Yeah. <laughs> na 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 na. Na 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 na. Well, look at the Beatles. There's lots of na na nas. Na 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 na. Hey. <laughs> Let's talk about improvisation. Yes. So, what is the role of uh, the role of improvisation for you in your music? The role of improvisation is yeah. to connect, um, to connect the com composition, to uh, con connect the composed material to the performer. Okay. And that's very specific in my case because what I write usually is extremely notated. It's overly notated. I know that. Okay. So I need I need musicians to play with me that can improvise and can improvise their way out of that notation. Mm. Because what I write initially is very specific. I want this voicing. So I did. I want this exact thing. And mm. only somebody that can improvise can improvise their way out of this little sort of little cage of these five pitches. And so for me, that can, brings my material, my music, uh, brings it to life, mm. right? Otherwise, it's just a notated piece that anybody could play, but it actually is not that interesting. <laughs> so that's my, <clears throat> I've learned that the hard way. You know, you have to pick the right people that are okay with doing this kind of stuff and understand what that is about.
But for me, that's improvisation is that, is connecting, bringing the com composed material to life. Mm. And how do you work improvisation? Is there a process in this work or is it just by ear and intuitive? Well, sometimes a piece is complete in and of itself and you hear that. You like realize there's nothing I should do about this. It's nice as it is and no real improvisation is needed. But when you say improvisation, you know, there could be the, the sound could be the improvisation. So <clears throat> in, I did a piece called uh, The Mission from my last mm. album and in which Ben Monder and I have the, the melody note is just an A and everything else is around it. So for us, the improvisation is to improvise the attacks and the timbre of that note. That's an improvisation. I know it's super, super specific, but that is improvised. If you ask a classical player to do that, they would, there would be long discussions about it. Mm -hmm. Like, what should I do? Is this okay? Is that okay? A jazz musician that I know very well, like Ben, I don't have to say anything. I just okay. say, we're going to play this A and you're just going to play some tremolos. And so that's an improvisation, right? When we think of jazz improvisation, we always go to the scat improvisation first. Like that's our improvisation. Mm -hmm. And I see that as one way of improvising. That's one way of improvising but that there's a million others there's a way of improvising on even on form which i've done with um refuge trio which is a band that i have or had i don't know if it's still around um with john hollenbeck and gary versace where we just don't even call a standard but we sort of know the same standards all of us yeah. so we start playing and somehow we end up with this standard and then we improvise the form we go back to the bridge twice or we elongate this a section and we put something in between and with all good players that i've played with i can do that right that's another way of improvising you can improvise the rhythm you can change all parameters of every aspect of the music that you're playing because you're playing with jazz players mm -hmm because we are so adept at going oh wait no left oh right oh over here over there over there mm. that's the kind of musician i love and the musicians that understand and respect other styles or other genres of music um and are open to uh to that and not tied to proving that they can improvise constantly mm -hmm. so for example with shy maestro I could be in C major for an entire piece for like a half hour and nobody would complain. We could just play diatonic for a half hour and we would be in heaven. Or we could play something really complicated and be just in a different heaven. But there's no uh, pre like there's no preconceived uh, pressure on how mm. we have to improvise and to prove to ourselves or prove to the audience well, you're an improviser now. You've made it through giant steps. You've made it through this. You can do this. Okay, now you're okay. Fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning of the discussion, you were talking about, about rhythm. What is your relationship to rhythm as a singer? Do you work it's a specifically? Terrible, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> it's terrible. Oh my God, rhythm just had a big fit the other day. Um, well, rhythm is, it's not so much the rhythm, it's the rhythm itself, but the feel of the, like, how do you feel rhythm in, in music? And if you've ever played with a classical, a seriously classical pianist or classical guitarist, for that matter, and try to play something in time, it's very, very different, very mm. different. Not making light of anyone's time feel, but it's just different. The way f music is felt, uh, I just can't. I just cannot. For me, music always has an underlying time feel. There's mm -hmm. always this feel of ding, but ding. And even if I'm playing something out of time, it is so clear with jazz musicians to do this. But when, if I do something out of time with a classical musician or with a folk music or whatever, it is always a lot of explaining, a lot of doing, a lot of... So 
the, the the rhythmic underlying rhythmic feel of everything I do is is jazz driven. I can't. It's only because I've experienced it this way, not because mm. I've made that decision. But I'm like realizing, oh yeah, it it my home, my hometown is jazz. Okay. And then I take a lot of trips elsewhere. <laughs> but I can play any repertoire of mine most easily with jazz musicians, well-trained jazz musicians. Even the Kurt Weill or the the, the uh, Charles Ives or the Schumann or the Schubert or the Wagner that I've done is always better when, <laughs> when a really well-trained jazz musician is playing that material. Mm. That's how I feel it. And what is your relation to free improvisation? Um, my relationship is great. I love free improvisation, but <clears throat> what I want to make a point of is that free improvisation has to be truly free. And that means free of the idea of free improvisation. <laughs> so if, if yeah. your idea of free improvisation is it has to be loud, aggressive and all over the place and and hurt has to hurt the ear and it has to be uh, a, just uh, this kind of free improvisation then you're stuck in the 60s, mm. right? For me, free improvisation is free of my own uh, superimposed ideas of what I should be doing. That's truly free. So if, if the free improvisation is just one note, yeah, then that should be okay, <laughs> right? So if the free improvisation, as I said earlier, is just in C major mm. for a half hour, then that's free. Of me saying it can't possibly be the whole you know the whole time in the same key and I, it has to be complicated and it has to be crazy sounds and it has to be aggressive and loud and fast and you know painful and hard to listen to those are all not free those are just mm. parameters I put on the music at that moment so I can understand that the sound is is very important for you yes mm. sound is probably the most important thing yeah Sound, melody, harmony, I'm not sure. It's still up. Rhythm, definitely second or third, not sure. Um, but the sound is number one, immediately. Just that is, yeah. that is, that is where you get me. Mm. So the, the, the way the Westerlies got to me was the sound. Mm. I listened, I put on their CD. And I was in tears. I was just like this. I've never heard anything like this. And how could I not want to work with with a, a band that, you know, the same with Ben Maunder. When I heard him in 1992 or something at the old knitting factory, I was like, who's this? That's unbelievable. Hmm. What kind of a sound is that? So for me, that is the first, that's the in. Same with Shy Maestro. When he touches the piano, I'm just like, yeah, I'm yours, whatever. Mm. Take me. Um, so for me, that's that's the way in. So you can really choose your musicians. <laughs> no, I cho they cho they choose me. Like if the sound, yeah. if I can't if I can't deal with the sound, I just can't deal with with anything. Mm. <clears throat> and you are also a composer. Um, so what are your processes and or composition technique if you have? some well i have a f not a lot of great techniques um but other than if i find something in the beginning like if i find a an idea mm. number one i try to tape it so i know what the what the thing is later mm. and then i try to write as many variations as i can while i'm doing it so that i'm not writing um let's say and then and then I go over the same chord over and over and over again to get to the third chord or to the second or the third chord and so I try to write if I have something then I go and try to write a lot of variants on that mm. um, because otherwise you start to hate the material that you've written. <laughs> because if you go over the same 
you know, first bar 300 times, by the end, you just like, fuck this, I hate this, this is awful, this is ugly, this is stupid. Um, also, not writing things down on paper necessarily sometimes is good, um, but just taping mm. and just playing. Because once I see it on the page, it's like, it's just a minor, that's stupid. <laughs> and you see the voicing and suddenly, that's just a A minor 11 chord, what, that's... <laughs> Right, but as as a voicing, it's really interesting. Or what about something is interesting sometimes is not clear until you listen back. Mm -hmm. So that's why taping is important, especially with my rudimentary piano skills. Uh, sometimes the voicing is the interesting part, or the the rhythmic articulation of what I'm doing at that moment is what makes it. Or the tempo sometimes is super important, but you don't know that because you you just don't know the piece yet. You don't know what you have. So taping and then writing variations is sort of my go-to mm. technique. And okay. also being free of, well, this should be that, or this is to this, or this is to that. And just letting simplicity come out, letting complexity unfold wherever it wants to, um, and not sort of putting too many limits on what I should or should not be doing. Sort of listening to oh where does this want to go oh no it's you know it wants to get more it wants to get simpler it wants to get more complicated here but mm -hmm. so that kind of intuition is kind of what I'm trying to develop mm -hmm. and during your career career you formed a pair with several musicians so let's maybe talk about those collaborations you had or mm -hmm. you have And um, yeah, can you talk about those collaborations? <clears throat> yeah, so I I work really well with other people, you know, like I enjoy it. I enjoy it both on a personal level and on a musical level uh, because it pushes me to do things that I normally wouldn't do and then vice versa also. I always say collaborating is one of the greatest uh, compositional exercises you can you can do because when you write for each other you get pushed to do things that you think you can't mm. and that's always been a good teacher so if I if I can't execute a rhythm or I can't understand why I don't understand this metric modulation or this you know why I can't sing this 12 tone row or whatever you analyze something about yourself and then you learn and then you get better at you know, mm. doing things. So that's interesting. And also working with other composers or writers is a great way to learn about, you know, how you can expand your own vision. So it's a nice thing. I think that when you're collaborating, you're looking for inspiration from each other. Mm. So as a singer, I have something to offer or as, a, as an artist or composer or creative person. I have something to offer to that other person just as much as they have to me. It's not like uh, one person is, you know, hooking on and then the other person's just hanging out there. We're both doing something to each other and that requires both people, both mm. to be open to that process. <clears throat> Sometimes I have things to offer that go beyond... Uh, You know, just the mere music aspect, but this it could be a personal performative thing that we, we do together. Or there's a lot of things that can influence uh, uh, music aside from you should play a C major over here, but, you know, put a A flat in the bass or something like that. That's that's sometimes the collaboration is really about uh, fostering, bringing out something in another person. Uh, that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. And it really very much like a relationship. It's not about what you get out of it, but what you can bring out of the other person. Like, how can you make that person sound better? And if that person thinks the same way about you, then it's that's a good collaboration. Yeah, of course. Right, rather than what do I get out of this? How can I be better, uh, sounding better? <clears throat> but... How can we come up with something together? How can I make you be more comfortable? How can I make you be more uncomfortable? <laughs> you want. 
<laughs> How do you work on your voice? Um, well, do you work on your voice? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. But right now, I'm uh, still not back from you know my from my regular routine, which is usually uh, just practicing on the material. So I have I have always some music to learn or some parts mm -hmm. to. So there's that. So let's say I'm I'm working on Scarlatti right now, learning Scarlatti sonatas wow. for a project, and so I'm looking through this material and realizing, oh, this part of my voice needs this or that or this. So I, you know, find what I need and then practice towards it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the practicing is technically like, you know, register balances or whatever. Sometimes it is harmonically f figuring out what I'm doing here over there. Sometimes it's practicing with my loops and my electronic processing stuff. Sometimes the, the practice is f figuring out rhythms or <laughs> figuring out pitches, you know, depends on what's on the table. And do you work with um, a specific uh, technique or? Yes, I mean, I've worked with my vocal teacher, Jeanette Lavetri, um, since 1994. Okay. And she has uh, developed somatic voice work, which is a Uh, CCM style contemporary uh, music style which is uh, not based on classical singing not based on bel canto and is a extremely scientific yet uh, you know human approach to singing so there's mm -hmm. no no imagery or sing over the waterfall or any of that kind of stuff but <clears throat> it's kind of based it's based in science and couched in uh, empathy, <laughs> mm -hmm. can we say. So it's a very human, very real, very realistic. It's not one size fits all. It's not a method that you can apply like a, 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 a cut out for, you know, mm. for a sewing pattern, um, but it works with each person's uh, voice and with each person's strengths and given talents. Mm -hmm. And understanding what they are and hearing what they are is kind of the practice more than anything. So understanding register balance, register isolation, register, uh, understanding constriction, um, and understanding what you need for what purpose. So if you're a pop singer, you need to sing differently for mm -hmm. the most part than a jazz singer or a folk singer or a, a rock singer. You know, mm -hmm. so those those are all different And, uh, and you functions. have a kind of routine? Sorry? And you have a routine? Yes, like a, a routine for me to... No, I don't have a, like the same routine that I do every day. Absolutely not. No, that would kill me. Yeah. <laughs> to... <laughs> <clears throat> and is your vo voice um, changing with age or with time? Do you feel uh, a change? Yeah. Yeah, I can't sing a high b this this high B flat anymore, but um, I can sing down very here now. That's A. <laughs> That's A. A one. Huh? Um, yeah, but what can you do about it? Yes, as I'm 55 now, so. Mm -hmm. 50, uh, 57, 58 is really where the change begins more dr drastically and the flexibility. Um, but if you keep singing, if you keep practicing, if you keep working out your instrument, y you should be fine. I mean, I've seen it in Meredith Monk, who, by the way, is the, has, is the one that brought me to uh, my voice teacher. Okay. Um, uh, Sheila Jordan, she's... 91, 92, she's still singing like a bird. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. Yeah. <clears throat> And do you have a, a vocal hygiene? Yeah, no, no smoking, no shouting, no screaming, no, you know, yes. Mm -hmm. I, but I'm trying not to be super uh, neurotic about that. Mm -hmm. Because part of my experience is part of my vocal hygiene is my brain 
like if I feel like I can't do something because I didn't have the right tea or I didn't steam or I didn't do this warm up or that lozenge, then I, that's worse. Mm. So I've, I've had situations where I sang, but my voice was incredible, but it shouldn't have. I've had no sleep. I was flying overseas. It was a dry environment. I was tired, blah, blah, blah. Voice was great. No problem. And then I have, you know, settings where I do everything right and I warm up and I do this and I do that and I sleep and I do that. And it's okay. Mm. So for me, the, the, the mindset is sometimes what gets in the way. You thinking that you should, be, should have done this and, oh, you know, I didn't do this warm up and it's the warm up for my falsetto. But <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst. And you can't, you can't win. Okay. Do you have something else you would like to tell me about music, about your voice, about <clears throat> life? No. Okay. Thank you Yay. so much, Theo. You're Thank so you for welcome. your time. It was sure. really, really interesting. And I love your answers. I really, <laughs> Thank I really you. love them. <laughs> so, Thanks for having me. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Au revoir. Bye. Bye. A bientôt.